So go ahead. Good afternoon, guys. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for allowing us to come and talk to you, although from far away, about our work here at Acre with EasyBuild. Um, I'm David Evans, so most of you probably already know me. Um, I'm an application developer here at Acre at Vanderbilt University, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm, 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 and I'm also one of the EasyBuild maintainers, so that's probably how you, you know, you have seen me. Um, here with me today, uh, there is also uh, Eric Kappel, which um, is one of our senior system administrators that is one of the two guys that also worked on setting up all the CVMFS um, file system and moving the stack to it so that I, he, you know, he uh, accepted our, my invitation to come and join this conf call to talk with me about the work that we did with CVMFS. So Eric, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Let me move this. Uh... Okay, uh, yeah, and, and just to add a little bit about me with this uh, slide, um, I was a uh, large collaboration physicist um, when I was at Vanderbilt before joining Acre uh, with the CMS collaboration at the Large Hadron Collider. And then I, I changed career, uh, career tracks to go into software engineering and systems administration. Um, and so the point of this is uh, saying that is that previous to this, uh, I was used to having CVMFS around. Um, and, and so that's, that's where this comes from. Um, the team of the, th the, three, the three of us that worked on this was, uh, first of all, Andrew Mello. Uh, he, he's currently a physicist at Vanderbilt, and he's really in charge of CVMS deployment and synchronization scripting, which we'll do, um, describe. Um, uh, Davide already introduced himself, develops and maintains our cluster software stack. Um, and really, I've, I've worked on some of the configuration management for this, testing and uh, benchmarking uh, the system. Um, um, so when we originally wrote this talk, the target audience was someone who's a user of LMOD and EasyBuild, which I believe uh, is everyone in this room, uh, but uh, somewhat unfamiliar with uh, CVMFS. Um, and the key problem that, that we encountered at Acre uh, and that we're really discussing here is uh, that we want to deploy the software stack that's been built with EasyBuild uh, that uses LMOD to an HPC cluster and really outward from that cluster to the cloud and do that at scale. Um, and, and to be able to transparently execute users' job uh, on an elastic cloud uh, with the minimal setup and maintenance footprint. So it's not uh, too much of a struggle for us to keep, keep track of this. Um, uh, at Acre, our software stack, uh, all the software is installed with uh, only via EasyBuild. Uh, the environment modules are managed by LMOD. Uh, we have 130 unique software modules visible to users um, uh, and uh, several uh, hundred easy config files in its own GitHub repository uh, with several tool chains. Um, so the question we, we have is how to deploy this. Um, uh, classically, I think there are two general options. One is to put it on a parallel file system, i.e. NFS, a GPFS, HDFS, Luster. Uh, at Acre, we use GPFS. Um, the, the, the good part of this is it's easy to do. You build the software, uh, you, you put the file on the file system and uh, point the users at it, and, you're, and there's no additional maintenance required in theory. Uh, the downside is this is heavily affected by parallel file system performance. Um, and when there's a problem with the, when, the, when there's heavy write contention, uh, when there's uh, nodes that are leaving the cluster, this can, uh, this can really cause a problem. Uh, additionally, this can be hard to mount on cloud instances. So if you want to burst out into the cloud, and like us, you're using a commercial GPFS file system, uh, that's that can be pretty much a non-starter. You don't want to add random cloud instances to uh, your, your file system cluster uh, for security reasons, and uh, there may be licensing costs, so this is difficult. Um, the second option for deploying the stack is to repackage and deploy to the local disks on the nodes. 
Um, and this means you have to do the extra work to produce uh, RPMs, DEBs, or whatever sort of packaging you're using. Um, so that's a lot of work in scripting for cluster administrators. Um, and if your software stack is large, this may mean you're taking a significant disk requirement uh, on the local nodes themselves. So if you're even using something like diskless nodes, this could be a non-starter. Um, so we, we've been pretty happy with option one in the past, but the new problems that have come about in the last couple of years uh, that have caused us to rethink this model is one, uh, as I said, trying to burst into the cloud. Um, it's not feasible or legal for us to extend our network file system into cloud instances. Um, and we also have the problem that our software stack contains licensed software and open source software. The licensed software we can't legally put into the cloud, but we can put the open source software and we would like to do that. Another new problem is graphical interactive use. Uh, traditionally, large scale computing, uh, our our large scale computing facility has been used for batch processing, but more and more we have research groups that want to run graphical applications directly on compute resources. And software has become available, uh, such as open on demand from Ohio State, um, the supercomputing center, which we, we've started using, which makes it easy for uh, users to request a compute node, uh, create a desktop, and use it in their browser. Once you do that, software startup times become extremely important in a way that they're usually not with batch processing. Um, uh, for example, MATLAB can, um, depending on right contention, depending on the state of the network file system, take several minutes to start up on a, on a, on a cluster. Um, and the reason, the reason for that is it has lots of tiny files. It needs to read them all and reread them all several times. Um, and while in a batch processing, when you, you know, the users are submitting jobs that will run for several hours, if that software takes three minutes or 10 seconds to load, it makes little difference to the user. Uh, but when the researcher wants to make plots um, and, and use the uh, um, computing resources in this way, uh, then waiting three minutes versus 10 seconds uh, is the difference between usability and, and having a system that's not considered usable for them. Um, so, with those new problems in mind, we really looked at CVMFS. This is used extensively by the high energy physics community. Um, it was developed at CERN um, uh, as part of the CERN Virtual Machine Project. And what it is is a file system um, that's optimized specifically for deploying software and nothing else. And this is really how um, the CERN, the large CERN physics collaborations, are able to deploy. Uh, their custom um, analysis and uh, event reconstruction software uh, to a variety of clusters, uh, compute clusters around the world. And, and um, Now what, what CVMS does is it acts as a read-only file system um, and uh, using an immutable data model. And this gives it a lot of advantages um, in terms of distributing software over a general purpose file system. Uh, because the data is immutable, um, you can get away with some tricks such as uh, uh, content addressing. If two files have the exact same content, then effectively they can be considered the same file, two links to the same file. And you only have to distribute that data once to a compute node. And you really only have to read it once into, uh, into the, the system page cache. Um, you can use off-the-shelf technologies. Uh, that's a standard fuse mount to uh, create a block device on, on a Linux on a, uh, Linux system, and everything's distributed uh, using HTTP. Uh, and for this, you can use uh, Squid proxies to uh, to scale up the distribution uh, of of the software stack to many systems. So a uh, little bit of a confession. I used CVMFS for years behind the scenes as a physicist. Um, I never really knew what it was or what it did. I just knew that you had to, your software was in the CVMFS directory. Um, I, I was in charge of writing comprehensive testing of our workflow on the cluster to make sure all of our components worked. Um, and I didn't know what CVMFS was. And that's, that's something to say that CVMS worked really well. It worked quietly and reliably for the CMS collaboration for several years on our system. And 
I, who was in charge of making sure it worked, never had to do anything. So that was pretty cool. Um, so, so based on that history and the new challenges we were facing, we decided to go see if we could um, make CVMFS work, not just for uh, CERN software, but for our own software stack. Um, now, the basic architecture of CVMFF, CVMFS is you have a, what's called a stratum zero. This is an authoritative system uh, which uh, new files are written to. Um, this then talks to uh, one or more servers which form a stratum one. And this is where people will read from the files. This pro uh, provides a redundancy um, and high availability. Um, if the stratum zero goes down, you cannot make changes to the file system. You cannot write new files and directories. Um, but as long as there's at least one stratum one up, then everyone can, uh, uh, all clients can, um, can read files as necessary. Um, then on top of that, uh, squid proxies are added. These are standard uh, HTTP proxies, um, and they will just uh, cache stratum one data and provide scal scalability. So if you only have a handful of test machines, you can read directly from the Stratum 1 servers. But as you scale out and want to deploy, you could put any number of squid proxies out front and scale to thousands or tens of thousands of machines very easily. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll take over. I take over here. Um, so I think it's worth to also give you an overview of how what, how how our uh, stack management pipeline is designed here at Taker because in some ways is one of the uh, approaches. So how do we deploy the software not only on the cluster but also on CVMFS? Uh, so we adopt the classical three stages development with a dev, QA, and prod. So the dev is the our let's say our contribution to the easy build community so to the easy build project so here is done by a developer like me or like feng Lai or or whoever else in our group wants to do it where you know we simply develop on our local machine the easy config files and then we contribute it back to uh, the easy config repositories uh, the advantage of that is well first to contribute back um, and then to have a feedback from the easy build community uh, where, you know, sometimes you're building software that you've never seen and, you know, let's try not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, somebody may have good hints on how to avoid issues. Uh, <clears throat> once the, uh, can you switch to the next one? Okay. Once the, uh, the easy config files are then merged into the easy, con easy, easy build, easy config repository, uh, we simply have a single uh, QA machine uh, that mimics the cluster, uh, that contains a copy of the cluster uh, stack and where we pull the uh, dev easy config repository and then extract whatever easy config, repos easy config files we need and then we can modify them depending on internal needs and then inject them directly into our own AZ configs repository. Uh, in this way, we have the flexibility of adapting the installation to our needs, um, and at the same time, to keep constant track of all the changes that we do on AZ config files to ensure reproducibility and avoid future errors. Um, the advantage of this is, um, uh, and also we use issues internally to chat, to keep track of problems we had on a software. It was typical before we adopted this system, uh, this way of deploying software of, oh, the user has this, we're having issues with this software. Oh yeah, I remember we, I solved that a year ago or something like that, but I don't remember how I did it. So we use um, issues internally on that um, repo to keep track of what is going on. So now the easy config files are ready uh, that are now merged into our internal repository are ready to be brought into prod. And um, the way in which we do that is we have a single user for all the admins. So there is a dedicated user to build software on the stack uh, via easy build. So he's the only one that is allowed to use easy build on the cluster. <clears throat> the advantage of this is that it simplifies the stack they use, the file permissions on the stack. So independently on which admin is actually 
uh, building the software, there is no problem because it's always the same user, so he's the owner. The advantage of the, the other advantage is, is that it prevents accidental stack modification. So for example, uh, if I, as myself, build a software on the stack, and then at a certain point I do a pip install and I forget to use the dash user or you know turn on a virtual environment, uh, the problem is that I would end up polluting the uh, software stack. Um, the other advantage of having a third uh, entity that builds software is that it's easier for um, user support team to debug and troubleshoot what the users uh, come out, the problems that users have with the stack because there is we have the same permission as users with respect to the stack. So it, it also simplifies that thing. So uh, as Bob the Builder, we then pull from our Easy Config repository uh, and we use the Slurm integration in, uh, Git, in uh, Easy Build to then launch, the jo launch jobs that build on our debug queue. Uh, one of the problems that we have on our cluster is that we have multiple CPU architectures. So in our debug queue, we have multiple uh, nodes of all the different architectures and we build the software uh, one time on each architecture. So if I'm building something, I'll build it four times for the four architectures. And the debug queue is connected directly to the stack on GPFS. So here, uh, so the debug nodes can read and write from the stack on GPFS. Once the software is built on GPFS, uh, we have uh, an automatic system developed by Andrew that it nightly syncs GPFS with our CVMFS. And once the sync is done, at that point, both uh, the software is available both for the cluster and for the cloud. So that's, that's in a nutshell how our pipeline works. And yeah. Oh. Um. Yeah, so the next thing is how to uh, how how easy is this to do? It's it's actually really easy because we started with a pipeline, if, uh, if I'm correct, where we we only we only wrote to GPFS, and then the whole cluster would read it back from GPFS. So in order to make it transparent to the user and uh, have it so that the debug nodes would be looking at the stack as a G, under the GPFS file system, and the rest of the cluster would um, would pull the stack from CVMFS. Basically, all we need to do is some clever sim linking. So what we did is we created some directory, a directory acre arch, and that was just a sim link to the network file system when you're on a build, build node. And we'd set that sim link to the node architecture depending on the node. So the software that was built um, against acre arch would uh, would naturally, if you were on a, uh, let's say an Intel uh, Sandy Bridge node, an older node, then that would um, automatically link to that architecture. Um, and then that the software would all just get naturally installed on Acre Arch. Now the compute nodes, what you do is our configuration management would simply relink Acre Arch to CVMFS, where the directory structure would otherwise look the same allowing us to also do a fallback to GPFS if the configuration management software noticed uh, that C of AMFS is down. And again, the sim link would be set to the node architecture. So this would mean that the software is available in the same place transparently to the user in terms of the file system hierarchy, but it's really being served on CVMFS or GPFS depending on where you are on the cluster. Um, so uh, just to show you an example, uh, here I am on a standard node. Uh, and I can look at some sim links, acre common and acre arch. So acre arch is a symbolic link to a system within CVMFS. Uh, we use the Oasis part, uh, server on the open so science grid uh, to serve our open so so source software. And you can see it links into a directory which has Sandy Bridge um, in, the, uh, in the path as this is a Sandy Bridge uh, uh, machine. Uh, we have a separate common directory, which we didn't mention, serves for certain binary distributed software where it doesn't make sense to make different, compile different versions uh, on the different architectures that all goes to the same directory. Okay, now if I go to one of our debug nodes, um, 
and I look at the sim link acre common points to GPFS 22 acre common. So if you're the uh, builder user, you can then write and update that directory. And overnight that will be synchronized so that the other nodes see the exact same thing. Again, if I look at acre arch, this points to the uh, internal, uh, the GPFS uh, read write file system. Uh, but here you can see we're, we're uh, uh, linking to the Skylake architecture. The other issue we had to solve in, in distributing this is um, differentiating between open source software and licensed software. Uh, for the open source software, we actually didn't need to set up our own CVMS FS um, server as we're part of the open science grid. So we were able to use their OASIS system, which provides this as a service to other clusters. Um, and again, what we do is in GPFS, everything works normally. All software is built in the same, uh, to the same directories. And then we can use sim links on CVMFS to separate out uh, the private and the public uh, software. So the module directories in CVMFS uh, will be uh, in the nightly sync. We just flag certain, um, certain directories as private modules, and those become sim links to another location. Um, if you're out on the cloud, these private links will be ignored by LMOD if they're broken. Um, so all the license software we host on a completely separate CVMFS instance. This is only available on the internal network. There's no external link. Oh, question? Or yeah. Um, how do you solve the problems with some software that are resolving those sim links from Acre Common or Acre Arc uh, down to the GPFS file system? into their bash files or whatever? The, the sim links are on the top of the directories, so... Yeah, but, but some softwares, when they install, do sim link resolution and t put, put the, comp the actual path into their scripts. Lots yeah. of software do that. Yeah, no, no, I, I see what you mean. Um, that, that's a good question. As of now, we haven't hit that issue yet. So it's kind of... You haven't? No. Have you looked closely? <laughs> well, uh, everything seems to work. When the, the, the image well. yeah. um, no, I mean, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, 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 good, a good point. Um, it, uh, it's, it's definitely, it's something that we haven't hit yet. So probably we are just lucky. Yeah, so going on with the, that good luck. So I can I could show you to this sim link. If I take a uh, package uh, like uh, if I take an open source package, Anaconda 3, oops. OK. Uh, this is a directory on our build node. But if I take one of our licensed software modules, like MATLAB, Okay, on the build node, these are both directories. Now, if I exit the build node and go back to the cluster, um, um, you can see that Anaconda 3 is still a directory. But if I look at the license software, This is a symbolic link and it goes to a different CVMS server, which is our private one. So what happens is um, if we go to a cloud instance, um, that will, MATLAB will just appear to them as a broken link and it will be ignored completely by LMOD. Well, if you're on the cluster, you'll actually see that when you run a module avail command. So here's a big chart of our overall um, distribution model. Uh, the in, in, internal, um, everything highlighted in blue is something internal and on-premises to Acre. So uh, for Acre, we have, our, um, um, we have our GPFS file system, um, and nightly that gets synced to our private Stratum Zero servers, and then that can go forward uh, through an internal architecture where we can set up as many uh, Stratum 1 or uh, Squid proxies as we want inside the internal networks. 
uh, cluster nodes can then um, read from that. The open source software will send out to uh, the Open Science Grid Oasis server. Now, if you're not an Open Science Grid member, you could also set up a separate server internally uh, to be your stratum zero. Let's see, the, sorry about the typo there. Um, and then that architecture has stratum ones and external squid caches. Um, so what happens is that our internal squid caches are reading from both the internal and the OSG stratum one and collecting together all of the software. Um, if you're on an external user workstation or a cloud instance, you could then read from the OSG, an external squid clash uh, uh, that just reads from those stratum ones and just gives you the uh, open source software. Okay. Um, and we have a little demo for the cloud instance. Um, so I've created a cloud in AWS a couple, I've created an instance in AWS a couple minutes to, uh, ago before I started this presentation. I haven't logged into it yet, so I'm gonna do that now. And what I'll do is I'll run a simple script to uh, enable, um, uh, enable LMOD and connect it to, uh, uh, to our open source software stack. Now, I've never logged into this, just to show you, I've never logged into this before. Um, oh. Um. And this is a stock instance of CentOS 7 uh, from the A, uh, AWS um, collection. So this is right off the shelf. So I'm gonna grab this simple script. Um, and then this could be properly, you know, from this script, you could create your own AWS image or containerize these instructions. So I'll just run it. And this will uh, set up and in just a minute or two here, set up and get, um, the software stack ready to go on this new image. Any questions while we're installing software? No questions so far. Okay. Now we're just populating an, an entirely empty environment. That's right. Yeah, this is um, so. This is just demonstrating uh, that this is pretty simple and fast. Um, you can. This is this is a stock uh, core CentOS seven image. Um, Okay, so now everything's installed. I should be able to log out, log back in, and type module avail. And then again, this is gonna have to read, do an initial read from CVMFS um, and uh, populate the, the internal cache. And there we go. So I can see uh, some compilers and binary distributed software. And I'm ready to go, so I can I can load whatever module I want. And I can um, uh, start doing work. What What's really nice about this, in my opinion, is that um, a researcher can use a create a container that links into CVMFS and that sort of dynamically gets updates to all their scientific software stack in a cloud image. 
Um, whereas if you were try if you were to try to put all of the software into one Docker image, that would be kind of a pain, and you'd have to do updates. This uh, sort of short circuits that step. Just to add, just to add a similar use case, um, another one is, for example, we have now we have a few users that they have some pipelines that are half on their local workstations and half on the clusters. So the the problem for them is how to have a consistent software stack that allows them to seamlessly move their the part of their pipeline from the workstation to the cluster and vice versa. So one of the things that we are doing now is, for example, to allow users, uh, obviously uh, with, uh, with our supervision, um, to allow users to mount the uh, part of our stack, so the GCC, uh, the FOSS part of our stack, directly into their uh, workstations. In that way, they can have, they can build the software and they can have the same software on both sides and build on top of the same stack. Yeah, so this is, this is an exciting new way we can distribute. Um, so the other, the other issue is with this issue of interactive startup time. Um, and here's, here's where we really had a problem. Uh, with the cold cache, and this, this is one data point that I'm showing right now, this shows the startup time of some packages, Python with loading, uh, I think uh, had uh, NumPy and uh, Scikit, uh, trying to just import those modules and load Python, uh, trying to load MATLAB and trying to load R and just run an empty script. Um, when we use the GPFS file system, which again, this is on a, a regular day, there's lots of workflows going on, you know, the, 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 op, the file system is under some regular stress. Um, you could see it could take as many as ni uh, 90 seconds to load up all the Python modules, uh, several minutes to load MATLAB. Um, and when we switched over to CVMFS, those load times uh, really um, shot down by an order of magnitude. Um, now, once the cache is warmed, once uh, the data for those files is on the internal, on the um, compute node, loading this software, uh, then the difference doesn't make as much, it doesn't matter so much. In fact, GPFS may be a little faster here uh, due to how it uses user space caching versus uh, the fuse mount for CVMFS. Uh, but in terms of the user experience, this is pretty similar. Um, and just to demonstrate what our users are doing is we have an open on-demand system, uh, which gives us uh, gives users in browser desktops that they can uh, launch and ask for. Oops, I should clean clean this up. Um, and a user might want to use this desktop to. Um, let's say, load and run MATLAB. Uh, and here's the step where we really had a lot of users' complaints. If there were any significant difficulties or stress on the file system, this could take uh, several minutes. Um, and again, with the CVMFS, all the little files that go into loading MATLAB can be uh, shipped, put together as a block, shipped over HTTP, um, and, uh, and, you know, if there are multiple files that have the same content, these can also be uh, read ones. Um, and so uh, this, will, this will show up for the user in less than a minute pretty reliably now, uh, which is still slow for any application these days, but it's a lot better than um, when you're trying to uh, load MATLAB over a, a rewrite file system. And there we go. Okay. Oh, and we, so we did that. Um, so the basic conclusion before we go to questions and, and further discussion is uh, basically we found this is a reliable and sim reasonably simple method to distribute uh, scientific software 
um, that we can ex easily extend out to the cloud or to other nodes in our researchers work groups that aren't we don't want to connect for whatever reason to our uh, cluster file system um, and it's also very nicely suitable for interactive use thank you very much and yeah go ahead no no i was just saying that that's also if you have any questions or anything on that side uh, we are happy to to help to answer you said you had dedicated you have dedicated build nodes correct how large is that system um what how do you mean, few, how or how few users do you have <laughs> Uh, no, it's just so we ha we currently have uh, one, two, three, four, five CPU architectures. Um, but also because we have one that has GPUs, so uh, so we have four uh, four GPU architectures. We have four nodes that are our debug queue. So what happens is that uh, I, I I understand your point in a sense of well, you know, just dedicating nodes just for building is kind of a waste of money and cycles so the way uh, in order to um, you know use them as much as possible is to put to make them available through our debug queue on the cluster so they are both accessible by the users for debug purposes uh, and at the same time available for us for building um, that does not slow too much our process because the maximum job that can be launched by users on the debug queue is 30 minutes. Uh, so, you know, if we have to build a software, worst case scenario, we have to wait 30 minutes. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the way in which, in which I justified to our managers how to, to give me four nodes, one per architecture. And if, if that's a problem with virtualization, you could reserve, you know, create VMs with just two cores on it, one or two cores on a node, and, and release the others for general purpose computing, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Davide and. Hi, this is uh, John Day. I'm curious about how you uh, are using. Squid in AWS is that uh, a standard image that you're getting from from Amazon or? Oh no, the Squid servers are uh, dedicated machines on premises. So that's um, on prem, and you you have a, a dedicated connection to you know the AWS cloud. Uh, so so the the um, Squids so that so for for the the software that um, so so we we have a compute node on the cloud here basically that that can access the software stack um, it's using the public facing squid proxy and that's good proxy we could have our own this one's actually ho uh, hosted by the open science grid and so literally anyone in the world can talk to the squid proxy um, you could we could conceivably re make restrictions based on um, uh, IP address or you know other qualifications, um, but yeah, as it stands, this is basically uh, exportable to everyone. Thank you. So yeah, so the the cloud node doesn't need anything, so any specific credentials to talk to the Squid server. We just we just stand it up and it um, uh, it immediately begins communicating. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Let's keep going. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'll stop the screen, the streaming briefly, so we'll set up the next talk.